Also, uh, this is not intended to be a negative meeting. It's going to be positive. Um, we're not here to bash, you know, our Forest Service representatives, our state representatives, law enforcement. That's not what this meeting is for. Um, several of the people are in this room uh, that I speak of, and they volunteered to come uh, tonight to listen to our concerns and our comments. And so it's meant, this meeting's meant to compile answers, solutions, recommendations from the public so we can form together, work with those groups of individuals uh, and representatives um, from different areas to come up with some solutions uh, and make it better for all of us. So just remember that when we get to the question and answer comment portion, uh, keep them positive, keep them short, uh, so we can get the most out of the out of the little meeting. I appreciate everybody coming tonight. We're going to go through the PowerPoint, uh, and like I said, at the end, we'll have some questions and comments uh, time. So thank you for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Brian Isley. Um, like I said, we're going to go through this PowerPoint pretty quick. Uh, first, this is a great uh, facility, and I'd like to thank Clarksville School District for opening this up. This is awesome. Uh, thank you. So Act 272 of the Motor Vehicle Code in Arkansas prohibits the operation of OHVs on public streets and highways. Uh, exceptions to the general rule are for farming, hunting operations, crossing a public street or highway, or as a means of transportation if a person has a serious walking disability or has one or both legs above the ankle uh, removed. Um, if the operator is an emergency or utility personnel engaged in official business to get from an off-road trail to another off-road trail uh, under three miles, from an operator's private property to an off-road trail or another track of private property. In 2017, the House Bill 1148 passed and was enacted into law, and it uh, put in the three-mile limitation on Exception 5, which is uh, you know, getting from the off-road trail or from the operator's private property to another off-road trail, off trail or another track of private property. So this was a good change, uh, creating a new circumstance in which uh, the operator of an OHV may travel on a public street or highway for the purpose of going from his or her private property. Um, it expanded that portion of it. That House Bill 1148 expanded that part that was not previously uh, a law. Right. And, uh, an or to another track of private property uh, as long as it's the most reasonable route. Uh, as far as enforcing the law goes, an operator is required to carry the proof of uh, ownership, property ownership, when operating uh, an OHV on a public street or highway. Um, so I suppose you're supposed to keep the deed in your back pocket. You know, pros of a three mile notation uh, that we came up with, uh, keeping children off dangerous highways. Um, and also it's been brought up that under the, you know, you could go from state line to state line on a four wheeler uh, as long as you said you're going from trailhead to trailhead, so that was part of the issue. Uh, yeah, part of the issue before is they're trying to eliminate that. And of course, cons of the three mile notation: uh, distance between approved forest service trails is greater than three miles, in, in uh, many instances, and uh, the negative impact on tourism in our state. At any given point, uh, we took a picture of the OARC general store in o in OARC. Uh, at any given point, you know, a Saturday, uh, there, there may be 40, 50 OHV riders that come to this area of our county um, to ride, you know, to ride and spend money at the stores and they buy, buy food, buy gas, you know, buy the units themselves, tires, um, and all the, the economic impact on that uh, is, is huge for our area especially. You don't have a lot of things that bring people into rural Johnson County, but riding OHVs is one of them. Um, and I think that's a, um, you know, that's a, a thing that's going to spread fast when people hear they're getting citations or getting, you know, pulled over uh, for, you know, riding four miles on, on that county road or that paid road to go eat or go to a, a campground, things like that. Um, that's a, a very big negative impact um, on, on this bill. And so OARC's in Johnson County, but we got a lot of visitors from other parts of the area. Uh, 
there's someone from Little Rock up here, and it's just great. But uh, Birds Adventure Center, Pam and Jen are here from Franklin County. So, uh, you know, the tourism piece is a very big piece. Um, some Outdoor Industry Association, you know, this is specific to Arkansas. Uh, you know, just some statistics, uh, pretty self-explanatory. 63% of Arkansans uh, participate in outdoor recreation. The numbers are huge uh, on the economic impact uh, that outdoor enthusiasts spend uh, in the natural state. Um, and that's something that we can uh, follow suit of some other states, uh, Colorado and, and different states that have embraced that uh, and not put a hindrance on it by, by rules and laws. Um, they've kind of embraced that and expanded their economies uh, to, for everybody to win. It's a win-win situation for the riders bringing in the tax dollars so uh, they can improve, you know, the roads, the trails, the different aspects of, of what all it brings. So just some information there. Uh, when you're talking in the, the billions of dollars with a B, uh, that, uh, that's a lot of money that, that this brings, brings in. And, you know, the numbers don't dial down to, you know, ATV-specific uh, recreation, but, um, you know, I got to believe those numbers are huge. And... Uh, you know, it'd be great if we could just make it bigger. <laughs> uh, the next portion uh, of it, uh, the House Bill 1148 was the first concern, and then the next portion of it um, is the Forestry Service um, OHV rules. Um, and it states that uh, OHVs must be ridden on an approved marked trail. Um, and so I think they have some examples of the, the maps. Um, but I, I brought one from our local forestry uh, office um, so you can see, you can pick those up and you can see somewhat where you're at uh, to try to stay legal on the trails. But here's an example of the, uh, of the map to carry with you, you might be able to cram <laughs> that into your glove as you're riding. Um, but, uh, but they do have the, the numbers listed so you can stay on legal uh, approved roads uh, for OHV approved roads. Um, you talk about that app? Yeah, so there's the, uh, the Avenza mobile app, and uh, this can be used 100% offline if you have the uh, trails downloaded to your uh, device. And, uh, of course, the, the printed map that the Forest Service office has that we just showed you, uh, you know, those, those are available as well. And, uh, you know, approved marked trails are great because... Um, you know, the Forest Service can, uh, you know. There's negative impacts of them. Uh, well, right, but the, the Forest Service can, you know, manage their trails better by uh, limiting what trails, because the trail riding may increase the levels of stream sedimentation, uh, cause ruts, deepening the stream crossings, um, or on the steep hillsides, uh, losing vegetation, growing in fragile soil types, uh, increased lat trash and litter, and some trails may not be safe under certain circumstances. Yeah, a little bit more here, uh, just input for me. Uh, but, uh, you know, when people go off the trails uh, and, and just randomly crossing the creeks and different things like that, um, that's something that as riders, if we see that happening, uh, we can self-police. Say, hey, you know, guys, we're, we're trying to, you know, promote OHV riding in our state, and you guys just, you know, cutting donuts and, you know, tearing up the land doesn't help our cause. So if, if us as, as riders, we see that, you know, it, it might not hurt to, to mention that, hey, you know, we're trying to do good here. Can you, you know, please stay on that mark trail or, you know, pick up your trash or different things like that. Uh, I know a lot of times we'll take a, a sack with us and pick up trash if we see it on the trail or side of the road as we're, as we're driving. It's usually not that much. Right, exactly. We kind of did a little, uh, a little study because we hear that a lot that OHV riders are, you know, throwing out trash and picking up stuff. So we rode um, up uh, at Mulberry Mountain uh, a couple months back, and they're on the approved trails uh, that you're supposed to, supposed to ride on. So we kind of did a little study, and uh, I think we rode, I don't remember, five or six hours that day uh, on the Razor and picked up about two handfuls of cans or wrappers or whatever that somebody threw out or whatever, and those are on trails that only OHV riders ride on. Uh, you know, we didn't see anybody out there 
picking up the trash other than us riding. So I don't think they just came through and made a clean sweep of it <laughs> before we went. Uh, but that just kind of goes to show you that most OHV riders are not out there throwing trash out. Um, they're trying to be good stewards of land, picking it up uh, as they're riding. Um, you know, on my county road at my house, I can pick up more than two handfuls of trash going a quarter mile, and that's not from OHV riders, uh, you know, throwing out that. That's from cars or, or people walking or whatever else uh, the situation is. So just kind of a little study that we did to try to prove a point uh, that traditionally uh, OHV riders are not just throwing out random trash. So possible solutions, both long and short term. Uh, short term, uh, you know, next time the state legislature gets together, uh, they terminate the three mile rule for uh, at least the county roads and forest service roads, leaving uh, the local officials responsible for deciding where OHVs have access. And, and then uh, a long term solution, uh, we believe, uh, you know, the more people I talk to where the consensus is where everyone would like to see it go is uh, passing comprehensive legislation reforming OHV laws in Arkansas uh, to be more user friendly, uh, open access to public lands, educate young operators uh, and encourage more visitors to our natural state, uh, boosting some of that revenue. Uh, tonight is just the start. Like I said, it was meant to, to come up with answers, come up with solutions, address some problems. Uh, some of that we can do as individuals. Uh, some of that we're going to need help uh, from our representatives and, and legislators. So there's lots of things uh, that are going to need to take place for us to, to make a change uh, in a positive way. So uh, we're going to ask you to stay involved. Uh, like I said, this is the first step. Uh, voice your concerns to, to your reps and senators. Uh, express your thoughts. Um, and there's going to be uh, several uh, ways. We're going to try to try to form a bigger group uh, where we can work together with the Forest Service and do projects, uh, do some trail cleanups and uh, maintenance, different things like that. Because a, a concern of the Forest Service is they don't have the manpower to to fix these issues uh, that are causing the erosion in the creeks or the trash or different things like that. And that's something that we can do, and it's only going to help us. Uh, yeah, it might be a, you know, half a day on a Saturday, but we're going to be riding and having a good time with our families. You know, no big deal to, to cut a few trees out of the trail uh, and, you know, pick up trash, things like that. Um, that's going to be a, a positive image uh, on us to non-OHV riders. It's going to help the Forest Service by not having their manpower out doing things like that. And it's going to help us because we're going to have cleaner, uh, better trails to ride on. Those are a few things that we can do uh, to help. The self-policing um, is another thing that I think is a, a big deal that we can do to help. Um, a lot of our area, um, we have around 80 miles in our forestry district of marked approved roads to go on. And part of that problem is there, there could be three miles of trails on this side and 10 miles away there could be seven miles and five miles away there could be 10 miles of trail so you know with this three mile rule and and the rule of you can't ride on you know these undesignated areas it doesn't make sense to have to load up your your side by side to go five miles to unload it to ride seven miles to load it back up and and ride again so those are the type of things i would like to see us get fixed and connect a trail system or do loops of trails where we can ride for you know hours and not have to load them up and uh, and trailer them to be legal. So those are just a few things that I think we can work together on uh, for a win-win situation. And so, uh, you know, we first heard about this, uh, you know, a few months ago. And uh, so we called this meeting together. We've been talking to other people and this has just been kind of a learning curve. Uh, we've had some people um, mention it would be helpful to get a 501c3 organization together so we can uh, get some volunteers together that care about this stuff and, and do some of the activities that Chris is talking about. Again, we talked about Pam and Zim being here. Uh, they have started a 501c3 and she has uh, yellow legal paper to get your name and contact info, but it's uh, Arkansas 
Backcountry Access Association for something very similar to that. And uh, so uh, she'll be around afterwards for sure. But at this point, um, I guess uh, we'll, we'll bring up some q and I'd like to thank uh, Senator Shovelfield for being here and Representative Pilkington and uh, the representatives from the Forest Service. Um, what I'll do is I'll come down the aisle with this microphone. And if I could ask some uh, officials to come up to the stage and uh, just kind of take the questions um, as you, as you, you see, see fit. fit. Yeah, just, just. And like I said, just remember, please keep this positive uh, question and answer. If they don't know an answer to a problem, they can, you know, get back with yeah. us at a later time. Uh, but right now, if you guys would come up and answer a few questions, we appreciate it. We'll bring the mic down. Let's keep it friendly. Hey, I'm Rusty Warren from Clarksville, Arkansas. Uh, I do a lot of riding. Um, my question is, is there any plans, like Chris was talking about, for the National Forest to give more trails accessible? Um, any, any meetings y'all have planned out, stuff like that, y'all aware of? If y'all can answer at this time. The question, the question is, are there any plans for new trails? Is that what you're asking? As of right now, no, no, no new pl new trails are in plans. Um, currently, we're working just to look at our current trail system and improve those trails. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at our current trails, we're doing. If you go out there, you'll find the the, the designated routes or it's that are currently open. We're having a hard time just maintaining those trails. So until we can get a better handle on just our current trail system, it's going to be difficult for us to consider too many new routes. So no, there, at this point in time, there's no plans. Well, I, well, let me correct that. We do have some situations where we have done it when it improves current trail systems that we currently have. Um, example is uh, Morgan Mountain Road and East Fly Gap Road and Beach Grove Road. We just, we're looking at opening those routes up, which is going to create better loops and also get people off the highway 215. So those situ that may be a case in point where on a case-by-case -case basis we will consider it for certain reasons where it improves the current trail system. Does that make sense? But it's usually a case-by-case -case thing. It's not one big broad plan that's out there. There's a, uh, there's a trail coming from the, uh, what side of the bridge is that? On the, west side. on the west side of the bridge going into OR that we've rode our whole life. We called it King Hammonds. I don't know what the Forestry Service Road is, but from the top, it's designated ATV trail, but it dead ends. It doesn't come out at the bottom anymore. Do you know why that is? I believe that crosses private property, and that's why that's shut down, because uh, I asked the same question, and Matt lives uh, nearby, and he answered that question for me. I, I, just, I should have introduced myself. I'm the district ranger for the Pleasant Hill Ranger District, Jason Engel, and Matt Feifler is our recreation program manager, so he probably he knows the area a whole lot better than I do. He's from this from this area, so he can answer those questions a lot better than I can. Some of that. My name is Monty Watts. I live here in Johnson County. <clears throat> I have a couple of comments, and then I have a, a, several different questions, and I don't want to inundate you with that, but I just kind of want to get them all out while I'm up here. I, I did want to ask first of all if we have any of our local hotel owners, motel owners, or managers with us here at all. Um, and I say that because y'all know for a fact, and I'm acquainted with um, several clubs from Texas that come up to Johnson County strictly for uh, <coughs> OHV riding. Um, and, uh, and I'm not talking about three or four guys. I'm, I, I'm talking about you can go down to the Hampton Inn or the Holiday Inn and find a, a parking lot completely full. Um, and it's an annual event for them. So that's a, a very positive impact on our community here. Uh, if you talk about uh, the, the hotel fees, uh, the employees that work there, their paychecks, uh, the restaurants that these uh, folks are um, uh, are going to, um, those employees, fuel costs and things like that. So I want to point that out, as, and, and that's just a small piece of the puzzle, like Chris was talking about, um, the um, financial impact uh, that, that that type of activity has on our community. Um, and then I did want to ask um, specifically if anybody would like to uh, address this, and I know some folks in the room that, that probably can. I know what your short answer is, but, you know, the dry spadra drainage has been gated off. And, uh, yeah, I know that is cutting through private property. That's closed off several thousand acres of public access to public land up there. As a landowner um, uh, here in Johnson County, I own land that borders the National Forest, and I lease land that borders the National Forest. And I know for a fact 
um, or at least I've been told by officials, I have uh, roads that cut through, forestry roads that cut through my property to the National Forest. I've been told I'm not allowed to close those off and deny access to the public through my property to get to the National Forest. So my question is, what makes that piece of property different than my piece of property or a lot of other people's piece of property? I'm not wanting to close that off, um, but I, I'm uh, uh, a little upset, as a lot of people are, that that dry spadger drainage has been closed off. Um, and I don't understand why um, that property owner is allowed to do that if, you know, I'm, I'm told I can't do that, uh, if that, if that makes sense. And then before you, before you answer that, let me just say one more thing. I, I did just want to add, um, and a lot, a lot of people ride the trails um, up around Murray Creek, Murray Creek Falls, Union Schoolhouse. Um, I just did want to point out, if anybody's been up there lately, you know, uh, after this uh, past spring and summer, um, there's one of those creek crossings that's been washed out so deep that at a normal water level, uh, most AVT ATVs can't cross that anymore. So I did want to know if um, there are any plans to try to resolve that issue, um, do any uh, reclamation on that creek crossing at all. Thank you. Sorry. On the, the dry spadger question about the road uh, there, I'm, I don't know this is all the specifics about it, but I'm trying to, I'm, if somebody can help me out here, Bobby, you might can. Is that a county road? It's, it's a Forest Service road? It is a Forest Service road? Then that gets down to, do we have an easement? And I don't know the answer to that question. Because if we don't have an easement for that private, pro that route, then that, then we don't have legal access. So that's the, that's the crux of that. So if there's legal easement, then that changes, you know, access. But I don't believe I, I, if it's gated off, it probably is because we don't have an easement across that private. Yeah, I think you're talking about um, prescriptive rights. And I, I don't know all the specifics about that, but I believe it's uh, something to deal with seven year time frames of being accessed. I, I don't know how exactly that would apply in this situation, but, um, but, uh, but we could look into it. But I, I don't think it, if it's, I believe it's something to do with something, access has been around for seven years or closed off for seven years, it makes a difference in prescriptive rights. I know most of you, I, and most of you know me, I'm a farmer and a state senator and an ATV owner. I've owned one ever since they first came out. And whenever this 272 bill was introduced, and I've spoken to the sponsor, what I would like to know, and we want to do whatever we can do to make sure that you don't lose any of your uh, inherent privileges to ride ATVs, and I don't want to lose mine either. It's the same way with the Second Amendment to me. But we don't need any more infringements on any of our rights. But what I would like to know, if someone can answer, what specifically is different from one year ago today and today as far as riding an, an ATV? Because 272... 272 actually enhanced the ability because ATVs have always been illegal to ride on public roads. I had a farmer who had a cow out not far from me one night several years ago and a, a, a boy on an ATV hit it at 11 o'clock one night. He couldn't sue the farmer because he was riding an ATV illegally on a public road. Uh, but this, gave, this 272 Act 272 gave people the ability to ride, you know, if, if somebody wanted to ride three miles down the road to visit their parents or, and I don't particularly care for carrying your deed in your pocket, I don't much like that either, uh, but it gave, it gave people the right to ride, and as far as the federal, you know, federal law supersedes state law. There's nothing we can do whenever someone's riding, especially if they're riding off of these trails that have been approved to ride on, if they're riding off of those. Federal officers can give tickets to uh, to uh, anyone. I mean, they can, they're federal officers. All their laws supersede our laws. But what I'd like to know is, so we can maybe do something to maybe amend this law or approve it, but what is, the, what is the basic difference from a year ago to today as far as Act 272? Can someone tell me? What what was it a year ago? A year ago. But you had to haul your four wheeler. You had to haul your four wheeler. But the what about what about on federal lands? It's a twofold, twofold issue. 
to the House Bill 1148 previewed that three mile right. limitation. And the Forest Service used to, we're not talking, nothing's changed in the last year on the Forest Service part. Those laws have been, yeah, they're, they're separate. They've been enforced for years, but they're starting to enforce right. that three mile rule. Then that's what I want to ask. Who is issuing the tickets? Is it state or is it federal? Federal. So most of these fines are coming from the feds. They're not coming from state game and fish or parks and tourism, right? These are coming from the feds. Sorry. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll talk in here so they can hear me, maybe. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, which I could be wrong on this aspect of it, uh, but I, the way I understand it, the LEOs, uh, the the Forest Service LEOs, have not been issuing um, tickets for the three mile rule. Uh, they're myself included, are getting pulled over, uh, and the officer was very nice. He explained to me the rule and gave me a written warning, but I did not actually receive a citation. Um, so I think that on Jason's group, I think that is what they're doing uh, from the input that I've got. Uh, but the riding on unapproved trails, uh, you know, maybe it's a trail that you've ridden on for 20 years, uh, and they catch you riding on it. They are issuing citations for that aspect of it. So it's a twofold thing. Uh, on the riding three miles uh, or more, and then riding on an unapproved trail. You know, this, this issue reminds me a lot of Act 746, and most of you are familiar with that, the open carry law that we have in the state of Arkansas that we passed back years ago. And it all depends on where you are in the state. You could go to some parts of the state, and you can open carry, and you're fine. In other parts of the state, they will give you a ticket or make you, or fine you. You go down to the Washita's, I just talked to a senator from the Washita's, and he said nobody is riding no federal officers are writing any tickets in the Washita's, but they're writing them up here. They're not writing them up here? Uh, not for the three mile rule. The three mile rule uh, that we know of, I don't believe there's been any citations written. There's been warnings given. Uh, if there is a citation, I think that maybe there's been a citation on the state highway, but I don't even think the Forest Service has written no citations. Okay. The last I heard was a game board might have wrote one citation on a state highway. That's it. So, but you're most of the three mile rule for from our side that I've been told it's only been warnings written warnings so if somebody raise their hand if you got a citation for the three mile rule exclusively that because there have been a lot of citations for other things like alcohol or getting on unapproved roads there's a lot of citations get written for that but if you're getting it written a citation please tell me I because I, I don't think there have been citations there's been warnings but I don't think there's been too many citations written on it My name is John Eubanks. I'm the state rep from across the river over in Logan County and have part of Scott and Sebastian and Franklin as well. Uh, just so you know what's going on in Little Rock, uh, a lot of people have gotten calls on this. Uh, the sponsor that ran the original bill is open for amendment. Uh, Representative Maddox from Polk County down in Mena has already uh, has a bill drafted that would address this. But the problem we have right now is you can't do this until you're in a regular session and the next one's in 2019. Uh, the only other case uh, way that could be addressed is if there was a special session that the governor called a special session and this was put on the call. Uh, uh, the governor's office is fully aware of this. They're, they're open to putting it on a call if a special session was, uh, uh, was, was called, but at this point there's not one planned before the 2019 session. I mean, I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but uh, I just want to assure you that people have heard your concerns and there's been work gone into fixing this problem. But I, I, uh, I'm like Senator Stubblefield, Actually, I thought the bill was going to make it better because I wasn't real. I didn't realize that there wasn't uh, that it was you were allowed to drive on public highways to get from trailhead to trailhead. I've got a farm in Greasy Valley, and uh, just south of Subieco, and a lot of people go by my place going down to St. Louis Valley and 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 getting up in the. Uh, uh, the national forest and everything so but I also know that a lot of people just ride four wheelers and they're not going any trail but uh, like I said people are aware that this is an issue and it will be addressed but it we really can't do anything to fix it on at least our part of it on the state side of it I, but I and I can't address the federal issues I would, have a, I would like to say I, I did speak to the Bureau of Legislative Research this morning and I also spoke to the sponsor of this bill and he said he would be totally open to any amendments 
to change this to make it better for the people who are riding four-wheelers. I spoke to the Bureau of Legislative Research, and he's looking in, and he said he thought it was possible that we could do this during the interim and not have to wait another year and three months to change this, to change this law. So if we can run it during the interim, which is the Legislative Council, which is the legislature whenever we're not in session, then we can amend this, we can amend this and fix this now. But it, do, it does need to be fixed. I agree with you 100%. I do have a question here. Well, actually, I've got a couple of different things, I guess. But one thing on the uh, just getting warnings for for the three mile rule or law. How many warnings are they going to give us? I mean, if I'm caught out there and they give me a warning, and tomorrow I'm back out there, is it going to be a warning or is it going to be a citation? I'm going to say a citation. I can't, I can't speak to that, but I will defend our law enforcement. Their job is to enforce the law as it right. is. That's their job. That. So, and, and, um, and so, therefore, you know, we're not going to ask them to compromise on that. If this is the law of the state and it's their job to enforce it, there is a chance you could get a citation. I can't guarantee you that you won't always get a warning. And I didn't. I, my name is Elton Hetzman, and I'm from Russellville. We ride a lot. Uh, my side by side's three years old, got 13,000 miles on it. But our officer up there in that area has really cracked down. Uh, I also helped camp host at the Longpool Campground for uh, probably 10 years. We had people coming from a lot of different states just for our OHD riding. Now they're afraid to come. They don't want to drive from Texas, from Illinois, from Tennessee, come down here and get a ticket for riding. So it, it has really hurt that area. It's hurt it very bad. Uh, another thing, and you guys may not, may not mean nothing to you, but the Longpool Campground for the past 10 years, you could ride. There was one mile of blacktop, which is forestry. And you could ride it and hit a uh, OHP trail. Now they have closed that down. We have to trailer for several miles before we can unload and ride. But the officer in that area, uh, I spoke with him several times. Never got a warning because I haven't been out there where, it's, where I'm not supposed to ride. But he is cracking down very hard on people. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have the exact answers for the Long Pool area because it's not my district. Right. But it's the district east of me, the Big Piney district. But I, I would probably say that uh, most the tr there's very, very last probably decade, there's been very few routes. There have been some, but not a lot of major routes closed. It's just probably more law enforcement presence going on. They probably were already closed. Uh, that's what I'm finding on my district is that there, these routes were closed probably in 2007 when they did the motor vehicle route. They, that's when they designated most of the routes you see today were designated back then in 2007. So when you get on a non a road that's not designated, it's a closed area. That maybe there wasn't. Now maybe you're seeing more enforcement going on, and now you, what you thought was open was actually always closed. But maybe that's. I don't know the exact answer though, but that's a possibility. Okay. Do uh, Tracy, you or Terry know the answer to that about Longpool? Yeah, I, like I said, I can't speak to that. That was that was another district. I think Mr. Edgman hit it on the head about the people not coming to Arkansas um, from other states. And, uh, you know, I'd like to, you know, they're probably going to Colorado or some other place that has friendlier uh, laws for OHVs and ATVs. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask the uh, elected officials on the, the stage now, I mean, um, okay, you've got a fix. In the in the pipeline, that's going to uh, to fix this three-mile rule immediately. But what about 
uh, the long-term economic, um, you know, what, what kind of ideas do you all have? I, I can answer that. Um, me and Representative Maddox have um, looked at some of the issues that other states have been dealing with when it comes to, to this, and we found that coffee may be a state, like you mentioned, Colorado, which has embraced ATV tourism, uh, may be something that we need to look forward to. We've also talked to the governor's office about this as well. So, you know, I really do appreciate you talking about the short term and the long term. You know, the short term is we have to get this fixed uh, with house, the House bill that was passed in the last general session. But in the long term, I think we need we do need to overhaul our uh, ATV tourism bills, and that's something me and Representative Maddox are currently looking into. And I think the model we like that we hear from a lot of people around here, and I've gotten phone calls from people from Oklahoma and things like that who you know, tell me that they want to come to Arkansas, but they're going to go to Colorado instead because they have more friendlier laws. So uh, that's kind of looking the model we're looking at. And so um, so long term, I'm glad you guys brought that up because that is something we're looking at. Okay, I've got a, a friend of mine that works for the Forest Service. I'm not going to mention his name. But he did, he did in fact, tell me that... Uh, our government, or you guys that work for the National Forest, would just about as soon all these gated off-roads be open and accessible to us as what we wish they was because of the fact that it costs so much money at a later date to go in there with bulldozers and man hours and, and redo a road that once was accessible and now it's growed up. So is that true, for one? That's the first question. And then the second question I, I'd have to say, I think that we're probably all thinking of is, can y'all like uh, make us out a, a map of every road that y'all are allowed to be on and then we're allowed to be on the exact same ones? Because, you know, we're, we all own the National Forest, right? So the, uh, the first question I believe is, uh, asking about belief that possible that we that there's an internal belief that uh, the Forest Service actually wants roads open all the roads open and uh, you know the, the you know the thing about it is anything we do when it comes to access it has to go through a process it doesn't really and that process is a lot of environmental as an environmental analysis and it takes a lot of public input and, and um, takes public uh, scoping, it has to go through uh, uh, what we call NEPA. And so if we close or open a road, it has to go through all those steps. So that, that'll, that, that's, what, that's what we have to do. If we see a route that needs to be closed or open, if we believe, we believe it needs to be open, we're going to have to do some kind of environmental analysis that's going to go out for public input. So, for example, you think we're closing a road just without telling you, then I hope your, your chance is that we have to do public, in, get public input on stuff like that. That's put, something we're going to do. So you're going to have an opportunity. For, if there's a project come up, and if you want to see a route open, there's also chances for you to provide input on that too. So, uh, so those are things like that. So I don't think it's, it, it's going to be just us saying we want to close something or open it. It's going to take a, it's a process to do any of that kind of thing. And as far as the map is concerned, the second question, is that we have a motor vehicle use map. That's our designated routes that are considered to be for people to drive OHVs and, ve and legal vehicles. That's the map to go with. That's the, that will tell you what are, what's open. No, no, not necessarily. There are administrative roads that are, that are used for access for like a timber sale project or to access a wildlife opening to do maintenance on those pro in project areas for, t for prescribed burning and other activities we do for administrative purposes. So they may be closed for the public, but that those, those roads are only utilized for administrative purposes. So we personally cannot go out there in our own personal vehicle and ride on those roads. No, we can't. We're just like you when it comes to that. But if we're using it for, for, to access that for, for a management purpose, meaning we're going to be doing some project out there, we're trying to do, we have some reason to be there for a forcer's reason, to manage, to, to do a timber sale, to, to do road control, to wildlife habitat improvements, prescribed burning, those things, then we can utilize roads that would normally be closed to the general public. Does that make sense? I, I understand if you don't agree with it, but that's the way it is. I, I think it's a good question, and um, 
what what I think one of the keys, if you want to get you want to look at how to improve, one thing we need to do is get better, get really good partnerships going. And, and I think I mentioned earlier about the partnerships that, that Pam and Zen are starting. There's those are example that organization like that. If we could build a partnership with them and start start from the ground up and start to work together to manage these trails and these routes. There's no guarantee you're going to get the trails you want open. I can't promise you those kind of things. Uh, but I can tell you that it's not going to happen by just sitting at a distance and throwing darts at the problem. You're going to have to get engaged with what the Forest Service is doing, get a part of an organization, and start working with us. Because there's the, the thing is, we're we want to provide good access and good. But we want to provide you the opportunity to enjoy the National Forest, but we have to do it in a responsible way. We really don't have the financial capability at this time to manage what we have currently. We're probably barely managing the, what's currently designated open, if, even probably not doing that very well. So to add, start talking about adding new stuff with no additional revenue to maintain it, no additional resources of management or personnel to take care of that, that's probably not a reasonable thing to do that on a large scale. But if we have partnerships, that presents a lot of opportunity to get grant funding, the opportunity to work through projects together, that, that's the, that's, I think that's going to be one of the biggest assistance, things that can help us in the long run. So if you look at things like the, the, the hunting organizations, you got organizations like the National Wild Turkey Federation, Ducks Unlimited, Mark, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, those kind of organizations, we form great partnerships with them, and it's improved the hunting opportunities on these national forests as a result of having great partnerships. I think we do a very similar thing with OHV, but we just need, to, need you to join together with us. That's what we really need. over here but you know keep tabs on it know what's going on over here two things i want to add is i've introduced a petition and got it going around it's just started a couple of days ago i would like to have all of our representatives take a look at this it's quite comprehensive and it touches on a lot of things uh secondly our we're buckhorn is our trail system over there in Crawford county and for granger uh we are uh volunteers through the ranger office and we do trail maintenance we do trail pickup cleanup currently buckhorn is about half completed it's not officially on the books yet and we are currently our group is currently marking and pre-cutting in all the trails so we take the burden of getting these new trails marked off for the forest service so when you want to know what to do, that's a possibility. I've got some forms here. I don't know if you brought any volunteer forms with you so that you can, these people can look over them and see what the, uh, what you have for these, all, these, your area. But uh, it would be good, you know, because that way you could, with the, when you're a volunteer, you can go in and work on the Forest Service, work on it. You can report back to him and say, look at what we've done as a group of people. That would help you get more work done with less of your funds and we do it over there it could be done here uh, when it comes to a petition when you uh, before everybody goes I'd like to at least look at it kind of thumb through it and see what you think any questions on the petition as far as why some of the things are addressed in it please let me know I'll be glad to answer anything I can is there anything you want to ask of me I just want to emphasize one other thing. I thank you for that comment. It's a good example of a, of a success story with volunteers. One other thing I want to point out in Arkansas, I think on the Ozark, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we have a thousand miles of designated routes in, on the Ozark. If you add the Washita to it, I think it's closer to 3,000. Am I right there, Tracy? So if you take Arkansas, the state of Arkansas, a national forest, that represents 25% of the open routes for OHVs in all the southern United States. That's more than anywhere else in the, United, in the southern states, from Texas, Arkansas, all the way over to North Carolina, any of the southern states. We have the most by far as open routes compared to anybody else. I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that we couldn't look at improving. We need to look at doing what we can, what we got. But I'm, I just want to emphasize that other places have a lot less than you guys have as far as open routes um, in, on national forests. So, okay. well, and, 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 and that's a good point. It's, there's opportunities here that you might not have somewhere else. On, on that aspect of these, guys, look at your MVUMs. 
study that because that's what you use for the law. And the problem with that figure you gave us, the figure is correct. I don't doubt that. But look at your MVM and see what you do. All of these don't go anywhere. They don't make a loop. You can't ride from trail to trail to trail. That kills us. We need to fix that. Yeah. I've asked for the next time in our district that we represent the general public to look at this when you do the new MVUM so that we address this issue. Because a lot of cases, the trails are there. And that is, that's an issue. Everybody that looks at MVUM has great concern over the way it is. Yes, sir, there are a lot of trails. They don't go anywhere. Now, they, as my opinion, they were set up for hunter's loop. And that's fine. A hunter's loop is not a trail. That's access for someone to go hunting. That's great, but it's not a trail. A trail leads to another trail, makes a circle, comes back, or something. You don't want to just ride five miles, turn around, come back down the same place. And, and I don't mean to dish you personally, that every MVUM in the state of Arkansas is that way. I, I, would, uh, I would concur, actually. Yeah. I, I, I believe there are, I wish we could have better loops and trails like yes. that, what you're talking about. And I think that's something we, as a group, could look at trying to do that as we build these partnerships. Those are the kind of things I want to talk about. But it's, it can't be done overnight. It's not a no, quick, quick thing. No, absolutely not. And it takes money. It takes money. And, and if we're talking about adding have. more right. trails, I know that. that's you when the, it gets difficult. And, and so, that's why we have yeah. got to get out there and help you put your, our blood, sweat, and tears on the ground, and we'll help you get this done. It's, it's happening. Just be, help us. Well, it's going to be hard to follow that one. <laughs> My name is Jeremy Carpenter. I live here in Clarksville. live out there off of Lone Pine, ride a lot. I do have one thing. I went to Colorado on a hunt. They have a permit for one year. It's 15 bucks. You put down your life history, what ride you're going to be riding on, and you pay that permit for that ride. That will keep the deed at the house. That will put 15 bucks for every person in here that owns a ATV, UTV, that'll help build our trails. And I believe everybody in here has probably got 15 bucks that they'd be willing to pay. My name's Jason Smith, and I'm from here in Johnson County. Uh, in my lifetime, I have seen more trails closed and gated and these trails have been open for years with zero to no maintenance. The trails are good for approximately 15 to 20 years, and then they sell another track of timber, and the logging company picks the roads. Then they're open again. This has been working for years. I sat through this in 2007 when y'all wanted to designate trails for ATVs only. Sorghum Hollow, it got washed out, eat up, when you put them to designated trails. We have a wonderful forestry system and good roads and logging roads, and it's all been about revenue. They want to sell us stickers. They want to, us to pay to use our own forest. I think that's wrong. We, I mean, the sale of timber, the gas leases that come off the national forest should, should support all your needs. So I can encourage people to vote. Use the roads that you have. We'll fight this through legislation. We'll have open discussions. This is just the beginning, but we need to address it before they take our lives away. Hey, y'all. I'm Pam from Birds. And uh, first of all, great turnout. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, we've been fighting this fight for a long time. And uh, I, I just want to say that this year, I speak really loud. Uh, for the first time, we feel like we are developing a great partnership with the Forest Service. Um, the most positive response we've ever had with them. Um, early this year, Jason and Matt came out and rode a trail with us that they were considering 
possibly closing. That's a super popular ride. And uh, after riding it with us and us committing to our partnership, they opened the gate to it that day. So that would have never happened in the past. I understand there's a lot of frustrations. And uh, we all want the same thing. We want the use of our forest. And like Jason says, I do believe having fought this so hard in 2007 and lost, <laughs> I do believe it's going to take partnerships. And for the first time, I feel like that's possible. So um, please join the association. We raise money and we commit man hours, and they do really listen to us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zen Bolden with Birds Adventure Center. Um, I just want to say that uh, there's actually two issues happening right here. You've got the state's changes to the law that took effect this year, and that has to do with the traveling on the highway, uh, or traveling the three miles, um, and that's what's created some of the issues that we're dealing with. We also have the second component, which is the National Forest, and what is legally designated as an open OHV trail. And I can tell you that on our district, the Pleasant Hill District, uh, since Mr. Engel has come to the Pleasant Hill District recently to be our district ranger, things ha have improved. Uh, there's more legal trail now than we've had in, since 2007. And the changes he's working on are very positive. And that will be um, an addition of somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 20 more miles of existing road, but they would be added to allow the OHVs to also travel there. So we're very happy with that. That's going to help a lot. And uh, working with Mr. Engel, he's, you know, he, he listens, he thinks about this stuff, and he, you can talk to him. And I appreciate that very much. Also, I have on my phone, back to the state issue, uh, according to what I was able to dig up for 2010, Arkansas Code Title 27, Subtitle 2, 27-21-106, um, uh, Operation on Public Streets, Highways, Unlawful Exceptions. In 2010, according to this, the language said that uh, it was possible to travel legally on public streets and roads when traveling on the public street or road was the most reasonable route of access available to him or her from one off-road trail to another off-road trail or from his or her private property to an off-road trail. That's the language that, that was changed this year, as I understand. Thank you. Um, hey, I'm Melissa Muldoon, and I just want to tell everybody that just because we may not get something done right off the bat, we don't want to give up. I've seen Christopher research. I've seen him stand out there at his house and do all kinds of things for a lot of months on something that he believes in. And I think it's something that we all uh, don't need to just sweep under the wayside and get upset when something doesn't go our way. I think tonight has been a very positive meeting um, we've had all kinds of good enforcement from the Forest Service, from our business owners, but as a business owner, and I'm standing here with Brian, and there's Pam and Zen back there, we bring in all kinds of people from every state. I have relatives and friends from Oklahoma, um, Kansas, all kinds that come to Arkansas because we are the natural state. That's what we've always been known for. And we've had all this, you know, beauty given to us, and places that we can go, and there's countless, countless groups. I mean, Pam, I go by birds every week, and they are full of those riders. They go, Brian can tell you, they, the, the economic impact on here. I have people come in that have, I do caterings for them for weddings that come out of state because they can go out to Oark. They can go to Mulberry Mountain. They can go to birds. They want to come here. Christopher and I were riding a month or so ago, in two hours, we passed $2 million worth of ATVs. That's not counting the trucks. That's not counting the gas. That's not counting the insurance. That's not counting the money they spent at all these stores. That's not counting the tax stuff paid. That was just in ATVs and a few trailers. So, like I said, we, we've got to...
make positive changes. We've got to stay after this, but we've got to be respectful of all the people that are trying to help us in these. And, and maybe if we had some more information, maybe if the Forest Service could put something out. Because a lot of these, you know, like us, we didn't know about any of this until it was too late. We didn't know that we could have went to and talked to our legislatures or our, con you know, representatives about it because nobody knew it was going through until it was already done. So, like I said, I think we should utilize all the things that we have here in the great state of Arkansas, and I think that we'll, it'll just be a positive impact, and it'll look good on our state, and we'll get those people to, Instead of going to Colorado, we'll get them to come back here. Uh, my name is Gage Bean. I'm from Clarksville. Um, Mr. Westerman has a bill before Congress right now called the Resilience Forest Act. And if I understand it correctly, it will remove or reduce a lot of the Forest Service obstacles that you spoke about earlier. Do you think if this bill passes, will that help our cause or will it hurt our cause? You know, I'm not an expert on this the proposed legislation, uh, uh, but I do believe, Tracy, you may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but it, this is focused primarily on insect and disease and fire dam damage. Am I correct, Tracy, with the, the new legislation? And so I don't think it ties into recreational activities. Am I correct on that? You may have to answer, help me out with this one. That I know of, that I haven't studied the bill real thoroughly. I think the big thing on it is um, how to fund fire funding. You know, it's it's got a fix for that, and it also has to do with some forest management activities. Of course, it's passed the House. It, as far as I know, it has not passed the Senate yet. So it could change a lot, you know, before it actually passes, if it does. And if I could, just one moment, while I've got the microphone, we've got a... Um, the Avenza that was being talked about, that mobile app. I've got several sheets here. If you do not have this, this, uh, this is a um, geo-referenced PDF map that shows all those designated routes. And so if you want to download this on your mobile device, I've got some of those information right here. And also have some of the travel in the backcountry uh, that shows the designated routes for all highway vehicles. So if you want one of those before you leave tonight, please, uh, Come get some, and if you uh, need more, then we can get you those. It's Mark Branch, and um, I've got a, a ranch that's surrounded by national forests. I'm in the Big Piney District, and I'd like to thank the representatives and senators for being here tonight. I know uh, we appreciate you taking your time to come hear our concerns, and I want to thank the Forest Service also. I know they get hammered a lot, but... I read some statistics a week or so ago about their budgeting and what they're trying to do today versus what they were trying to do 10 years ago. And it's, you know, it's, uh, I wish I would have brought them because it, it really does open a person's eyes to what they're up against. Um, being a landowner, I've fought some of the things that the Forest Service has fought with people cutting down trees, cutting fences, ripping down gates, uh, and that sort of thing. And that, that can be frustrating. Uh, but at the same time, I love to ride ATVs too. So I sort of see it from both sides. Uh, one question I have is, is it the ranger in the district's decision on how that land is gonna be managed? Is that ultimately his decision or is that coming from a higher level? That's one question. The other question I have is, why is it that we have quite a few roads that are open to cars and trucks and logging trucks and such, but you can't ride a four-wheeler on them. Uh, there's no environmental impact there per se. Uh, let's take Long Pool Road, for example. That's a paved road, so you can't tell me that, that the four-wheelers are having some sort of environmental impact on the pavement. And so there's lots of roads that, that are open, and, and and I don't know that the senators and the representatives are aware of this, but in the forest there's tons of roads that are maintained and graded and upkept that you can drive a car or truck on or a logging truck, but you can't ride a four-wheeler. And that, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'm wondering why that is and how that decision is made. The, uh, as far as decisions are made, um, there's two 
basic levels of line officer, what they call a line officer, decision maker, and enforcer at, at, at our level. There's a force supervisor that works out of Russellville and who's over all the districts, the ranger districts. And that usually decisions at that level are programmatic level, kind of broad, like a force planning level decisions um, that affect all the ranger districts. Um, then there, and there's current, sometimes there's other large projects that cover multiple ranger districts that may go through the force supervisor. Uh, then there's local level decisions at a district level, which is I'm a ranger district, and that's, that lies with the ranger district, the, the district ranger. And so what we have to do, we have a project like what you're talking about. Say you want to open a, a road that's closed, or vice versa, you want to close a road that's open, okay? So what that would have requires a NEPA environmental analysis. And so we have to have archaeology review it. We have to have biology review it. It has to go through concurrences with multiple agencies. So it takes a lot of steps, and it's, there's there's other there's not just a simple me just go and say yeah that's a good idea let's do it it's not that simple, so it has to go through that process, and then once that environmental analysis is done there's usually alternatives presented then we have to go through that process then I can, then at that point I can write a decision which says what's I, what I want to do as far as what decision on opening a road or closing a road or cut a timber sale or not cut a timber sale vice versa it's any, any project, and then. That uh, then that goes through an objection process. So somebody could object to it, and then we have to go through a whole new review process on objections. So there's a lot of steps in any project we do, any decision we do. There are things we can do category exclusions on, but usually those are small projects. So uh, that's just. It, but, but when it comes to road designation, it requires environmental analysis. So that's that's why it's it's yes. I, decisions lie with a lot of those local decisions lie with the district ranger myself on Pleasant Hill but it's still not a simple thing to do for me to quickly make a decision. As far as the question about why are vehicles allowed to go certain places and OHVs not, well, that matter is certain roads are designated for legal, um, highway legal vehicles. That's why it's designated to be. And so when you, the, the questions get into, especially in larger, higher use roads, is like when you have a lot of highway vehicles versus in OHVs together, the mixed use going on there. So it has to be considered how that's being done. It may be resource impacts. It may, I, it's hard to say on a specific case. It's usually a case by case thing. It's hard to say. I don't really know what the logic is on, a, on any specific one road, why this one's designated as OHV and why this one is not. But the difference is some are, OH, some are a OHV legal, uh, all designated for all vehicles, and some are designated as highway vehicle only. And the highway vehicle only is, I think, the ones you're talking about, that, you know, you see a, a log truck go down, but OHVs can't, because those are, those are roads that have that, that's the way it was des developed when they did a motor vehicle use analysis, or motor vehicle travel management review back in 2007. That's the way it was designated. So that's, that was made back in 2007. Was that a force, force supervisor decision? I believe that was a force supervisor decision back to, when, the, was it 2007, Tracy, am I right? When, Yes, when they made when that decision was done, that was a force supervisor de level decision at that point. And so at this point, we're not looking at reviewing, redoing the travel management rule. What we want to do it is on a case by case, project by project level basis. So best way I can suggest, if you have an issue with a specific road, we do. Matt, you might want to show them. We have a map. We do an order entry. Every district does this. We go around the whole project. We look at a project. Well, yeah, can you see our map? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, we brought a map. I wish I could put it up here. But it, we have a map, and it shows you our large-scale, uh, large landscape. These are several thousand, hundreds, of, you know, maybe a 10,000-acre landscape area. And we do projects on those landscapes. We cover, we move around. We do an EA for this area, then we move to the next one, do an EA for this area, and we move around on those. And what we do, and those, those are the best times I can suggest to you to provide input on a road you'd like to see changed. Because we're already doing EA for timber sales, prescribed burning, and other things. So while we're at it, we might as well look at roads. So if you want to do that, that's, I would suggest come by our office or call our office, get on our mailing list. You can get copies of all these proposed projects when they come through. And when you see one of these landscape project areas and you just cover an area you're interested in, that's a great time to provide comments to us. By doing that, you, you, put the, you get the wheel spinning for us to start considering these any routes you'd like to look at. That's a great time to get involved. Yeah. But I, I, the National Force. Go ahead. I, I don't know the specifics of Colorado and how Forcers designated their routes. 
But I guarantee you they have a motor vehicle use map just like we do, that those routes are on that map because that's a national thing. That's a nationally, that, is, that was a federal law that required us to go through that. So they're going to have a motor vehicle use map just like we do. It may be the, the road you're talking about might be on that map, but they're gonna, that's basically the same rule for them as it is for us when it comes to what's designated. You have to be on designated routes that are on the motor vehicle use map. Am I right, Tracy? I'm looking at her to make sure. Yes, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gary Carruthers from uh, Russellville. We have some land up at Treat, right there where Moxon and Indian Creek meet. And uh, we've ridden up there for quite a few years. And, and uh, when I learned about the three mile rule, I, I sat down with a map and a compass and started circling how far can I go. And it looks like I can't go hardly anywhere from my land without getting on gravel road to get from trailhead to trailhead. Uh, that, it's just one of those areas where the things don't link up. So I'd like to, I'd like to someday see a fix for that. And the other thing is that the people from the area, do you know what we call the buzzard roost? All right, there's a trail from both Indian Creek and from uh, what we call Mop and Flat Road Treat Road now, and uh, <clears throat> for the life of me, I thought that was on a map. And I look at the map here; I, I can't even find it on this map. So, uh, it, well, it's not on the map that's 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 OHB legal map. So, evidently, we are rampant violators of this. That we didn't know it. <laughs> um, the other thing is. That, that's one question. I, I, is is that a, not a trail that, that would get a citation to take people to see that? There are signs at at the roost, at the rock, that says no a, no ATVs below this point. So we uh, we assume that the trail getting there was an ATV road. So can does anybody know the answer to that question? Another question that I have. Uh, on a, what's clearly marked a, a, a legal trail. If a tree falls, we get a washout. Are we the private citizens legal by clearing the tree, uh, rocking the trail, armoring the trail like we do on mountain bike trails? Uh, uh, is that something that's in our uh, prerogative to do legally? Terry, can you answer that question? You probably answer that all better than I can. Regarding use of uh, clearing trails for uh, with chainsaws, we want you as a partner. Yeah. Okay. That that may, what I, uh, I I think that would uh, the, the, ex the example I can give you on something like that that I know that we do like the Ozark Highlands Trail Association for example, uh, we have a partnership with them, and we train them on how on saw. And they have crews that can go out. They're trained by the Forest Service as our volunteers who go out and clear a trail with saw crew. But they do take a short course with us to do a saw certification. That's 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 this process that would, I mean, with OHVs, I'd like to see that. I'd like, love it Have we had a group of OHV users who wanted to go through the same thing those at Highlands Trail Association did and get saw certified. And then when you're out on a trail, you got a saw you're legal to cut it because you've been through the certification as a volunteer for the foresters to do it. Am I right, Trey? That, is that right? Okay, good. And that is something we can go to the local forest office and... Well, I, it needs to, like I said, I'm going to suggest it again. It's not an individual by individual basis. This needs to be something you do as a collaborative group, a partnership. We, we, we want to work with a group of people. It, it, so I prefer it to come in as a as an organization who wants to do a training together, we're not going to do a training one person at a time. We're going to do a group of people as a, like this association or this group will train us, you know, handful of people in there to do this kind of work. And we have done this with our local mounting, mountain biking groups on the uh, Corps of Engineer properties. Same, same program. Okay, so I, I don't want to bogart this too much longer. Uh, I do appreciate you guys being here. This is uh, this has been a big deal, and and I know that earlier this year there was a, a big ruckus up around Max Pines, and something posted on their 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 uh, door there uh, 
10, or 36 CFR, I can't remember all the designators, but it basically said that we can come in and clear your vehicle, or confiscate your vehicle or whatever it is, and that put a lot of fear in people. And, and I realize you get 200 people out there, there's going to be some trail beaten up and, and stuff, and most of the people that I ride with, we don't like that. I won't ride with a group that cuts donuts in the middle of the, of the creek just to show off because that runs everybody off. I've seen it once, more than once. And, you know, those guys are not, not part of my group anymore. So there are a very big contingent of people here that would love to see this similar to Colorado. And, and I hope that we can get this into some sort of a, a legislature assembly before 2019. So uh, please put out word on how we can do that. And, and I appreciate your time. Uh, Michael Wright from Franklin County. I'm uh, I'm puzzled at the fact that uh, it seems like it, it uh, all these people out here they love to ride. Everyone, I'm sure, you got a lot of money tied up in your stuff, and you can take two or three people and just mess it up for everybody. And it seems like that it, it takes y'all a a lots of money just to try to figure out that we're messing things up with our four-wheelers and our uh, side-by-sides and stuff when y'all will let a lumber company come in there and absolutely destroy <laughs> our forests. Before, before we go on to the next question, I'm Sarah Cap. I'm the state representative for District 82. I cover Franklin County, um, the southern portion of Madison County, and a small part of Crawford County. So my district essentially runs up the pig trail up 23. And I have maintained contact um, with Mulberry Mountain. You know, they have the ATV festivals that come through there. And I just want to emphasize how important it is for constituents to maintain contact with us. This, um, you know, um, bill went through the House relatively quickly. There were eight votes against, 73 votes for. I had no constituents reach out to me saying, hey, you know, there's an issue with this. And then after the fact, you know, hindsight's 2020, everyone starts getting these warnings. And then we go back and we look. And from examining um, the presentation on the House floor, it was a public safety issue because of, you know, children being on ATVs um, from extended periods of time, and, you know, people wanted, of course, our children to be safe. I want to compliment you guys because this is wonderful, seeing a big group of people like this. You can effectuate change by advocating a specific view, not necessarily being fiercely adversarial. Um, so please continue to contact us. Um, I have a, a copy of a bill with me tonight that Representative Maddox has drafted, and he has maintained contact with myself, Representative Pilkington, and Representative Eubanks. And so the short-term fix is in the works. And please rest assured that we're going to take care of this problem on a sh short-term basis. But as far as any long-term changes, that's where you guys are key and essential for you to continue to let us hear these issues and concerns that you have and what you want to see changed because we really do need your input because you guys are out there, you're in the field, you know what your concerns are. So thank you very much. Got one more. Yes, Bobby Hatchett, Johnson County Road Department. Um, I co-op with uh, Forest Service and, and been real good uh, to co-op with them and glad to have you guys here tonight. Um, it's really special uh, just thinking about all the cooperation between everybody. Um, also, just thinking about um, the county judge being the CEO over the roads in each county whether it's county by county, um, he is the road king. He decides on the county roads what goes and what doesn't go. That's not brought down by forestry or anything. That's, that's just his decision, whether you can ride or not. It's not being forced 
by our county by any law enforcement if you're not tearing up the road you know I've saw trucks do more environmental impact than a side by side so that's just where I'm at uh, we fix the roads we co-op with roads for the Forest Service they've been real good and we try to help them and hopefully we can all work together on this and work it out appreciate having you guys And I, I want to share the same thing. I really thank you for being here too and sharing your, your what, you, what you hear ideas and be willing to talk to us and work with us. I really thank you for that. Thank you for Chris and Brian for putting us on, and thank you for inviting us. And uh, and you know our goal really is to care for the land and serve people. That's really the Forester's motto. That is our motto. And you know this is your national forest, and we intend to we want to manage it for the best for the best of the people and for the future conservation of these resources for present and future generations. So when we're doing this, what this, the things we're doing, we're doing it with trying to make the best decisions we can. We're not saying we're perfect in everything we do, but we're trying to do the best things we can to ensure these resources are here for our children, our grandchildren into the future, and that our public can enjoy it, but also we manage the resources in a, in a conservation ethical way. And that's really what we're trying to do when we do this stuff. And so understand that we really do want to help you better enjoy this forest, but we have to do it in a responsible way. I hope you understand that. I just kind of want to close. Uh, I was basically going to going to mirror uh, what Mr. Watts said there. And, and Jason, we appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for everyone up here as well. I know it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, we'll try to communicate uh, a lot on Facebook and the internet just because it's an easy way to, to get the word out. Uh, we're going to try to do some co-op groups, uh, work with uh, Pam and Zan's group, uh, and get some, some projects going. So I appreciate everybody coming out. Y'all have a good night.